Are you looking to implement or evolve zero trust deployments inside of your organization? Then stay tuned because in this episode of the Azure Essentials Show, we are going to look at zero trust and how to start implementing it into your organization. Welcome back to the Azure Essentials Show. I'm Thomas and I'm here with Brandon, Principal Customer Engineer at Azure, to chat about zero trust guidance for networking. In the first episode of this two-part series on zero trust, we will get an overview of zero trust, explore the free design principles behind zero trust, and find out how Azure can help you in your own zero trust journey. The next episode, we will look at ways you can begin to implement zero trust. Before we jump into the conversation, make sure to check out the description below to find all the links to all the resources we are talking about today. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to the Azure Essentials Show so you don't miss out on any future episodes. And if you have any questions, be sure to leave a comment below and we will come back to you. Brandon, thanks for joining us today to walk us through Zero Trust. Thanks for having me. Brandon, can you explain the concept of Zero Trust to our viewers? Sure thing, Thomas. Zero Trust isn't a product or a service. It's an approach for how to design and implement your security. It's a security strategy that assumes everything you're in, in your environment is at risk. Zero trust means there's no such thing as a trusted asset or environment. Everything deserves to be validated. It's all about being prepared to detect and respond to modern cyber threats. Think of zero trust as a integrated security philosophy that extends throughout your entire digital estate. This is an end-to-end -end strategy that adapts to the complexities of today's environment. It embraces the mobile workforce and protects user accounts, applications, and data wherever they're located. Yeah, I mean, this is fantastic, especially in the hybrid world we are living in, where we have workers remotely or inside, um, versus where we still have these castles right around our environments. So um, we talked about a little bit about how it is, but can you have a look at these different uh, practices? Sure. Uh, at its core, Zero Trust is about three design principles. The first principle is to verify explicitly. Just because something originates inside our network doesn't mean it's legitimate. We should look at every available data point to determine if something should be allowed. Just because you're coming from inside of the castle doesn't mean that you should be allowed into the treasure vault inside of it. So for example, should a user have access to a file? We don't want to just know if their account has access. We want to know if the machine they're using is up to date with all security controls. If it's not a secure device, we should prevent them from accessing sensitive information. The next principle is to use least privilege. This means users and systems should have the bare minimum of privileges to do what's needed or just enough access. And this access should be given when it's needed and removed when it's not needed or just in time access. This principle is also about using adaptive policies based on risk to make these decisions and protecting sensitive data so it can't be easily exfiltrated even if it is accessed. The last principle is to assume breach. Assume that a compromise will happen or has already happened and that we need to secure against that. You want to limit access between resources, minimize the blast radius, and verify end-to-end -end encryption. This way, even if a compromise occurs, you can detect and protect. Those are the three principles. And Zero Trust is really just about applying each of these across all of the technologies in your environment. OK, so this sounds like a lot uh, to consider. And especially users uh, today, they can feel sometimes that security can get in uh, their way. So when we talk about um, Zero Trust, does this keep uh, business users from working in the way that's best for them, especially in the world of remote and hybrid work where we can basically work from anywhere? Yeah, zero trust shouldn't stand in the ways of uh, way of users being productive. If anything, zero trust should empower that remote and hybrid work because it's about having secure connection and secure connection from anywhere. What's important in these practices is that you want to build them so that you can actually use them in your organization. Because the easier it is for a user or a device to be secure, the more secure that user or device will be. So Zero Trust is more like an enabler for remote and hybrid work in the world we are today. But to stay protected, you will want to apply it across your entire organization? Yeah. You want to apply these across your whole technology stack. There's a lot of discussion about Zero Trust as a uh, tool for identity. But 
you really want to apply them across of different things that we call pillars. Identity is one of them, but you also have endpoints, data, and networking. Just applying zero trust practices to one pillar of the technologies in your environment isn't going to give you the full benefit. Just securing one aspect isn't really adopting zero trust. A unifying strategy and security policy with zero trust breaks down the different siloed information technology teams so that you've got better visibility and protection across your whole IT stack, which results in a more robust security posture. It isn't just about networking being secure and identity being secure and them not talking to each other. It's about that all-in-one approach. A zero trust approach also prioritizes routine task automation, reducing the manual effort so security teams can focus on addressing critical threats. OK, so if a company or organization now decides to implement zero trust, uh, how can they find out where they are in their zero trust journey? And where do they know how they actually need to improve? Yeah, so organizations can use a, a maturity model to uh, figure out where they're at and where they need to improve. Organizations that are just beginning their journey with zero trust are in what we call getting started. They need to focus on reducing password risks with strong authentication methods, simplifying and securing access with single sign-on, and getting visibility into their environments. But more mature organizations are what we call advanced. They're using real-time analytics to make smarter decisions about what they allow, looking across multiple pillars to detect advanced threats, and they're proactive about finding and fixing vulnerabilities. Our mo most mature organization uh, we call optimal. They are dynamically enforcing policies using automated threat detection and improving their user experience while providing the most secure environment they can. So some of these sound like good security practices to take. Absolutely. Zero trust is really just about using all of these good practices together. It's not just one answer. It's applying a lot of different uh, processes. So when we look at each pillar, you could be at a different level of that maturity model in each pillar. You could be in optimal and identity, but just getting started with securing your data or applications. Living zero trust is about continually looking for areas to improve, not about just implementing a few technologies and calling it a day. Yeah. So that's obviously great things to figure out where to look at to figure out the next steps in your zero trust journey. Um, once you know where you want to improve, how can the partnership with Azure help you to continue the implementation, the evolution of zero trust within your organization? Yeah, so Azure provides a variety of resources and tools to give your organization significant progress out of the gate. We've got instructions for tools and configurations that can be used to support adoption in each pillar. While there are products that you can deploy, like DDoS protection or Azure Firewall Premium, that help customers get visibility and control, there are also deployment guides for how to secure in-place resources. It's not just about implementing a new product, but making sure what you have is uh, using what's available to be secure. Remember, it's really not about putting products into place, but linking these different products together to give you a full picture. Because Azure products come with these principles in mind, it's straightforward to integrate them with the security platform services like Sentinel to get visibility and start building automated detection and response rules. When you're planning your Azure deployments, you can use security design recommendations to build with zero trust first instead of having to fit it in later. So Brandon, um, thanks for sharing so much about zero trust. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Be sure to check out part two of zero trust where we cover how to implement uh, zero trust with Azure landing zones. And thanks for watching the Azure Essential Show.